I'd like to preface this by saying that, at the time, I didn't find this story spooky at all. My dad, on the other hand, certainly did. When I was around nine, my dad used to take me fishing quite often, especially in good weather. I'll admit I was never that interested in fishing, but I did like being outdoors and hanging out with my dad, so I was happy to go with him. Tired of our usual catch of teeny tiny sunfish and the occasional equally teeny tiny perch, my dad picked a different fishing spot that day. Unlike the ponds I was used to, this was a river, and the fast-moving current splashed us both as my dad cast his line. We hadn't even been there an hour when I got bored with the fishing. Setting down my fishing rod, I began to climb around on the rocks on the riverbank, pretending to be a superhero or maybe a marine biologist. I was an odd little kid, so it could have gone either way. I was checking to see if there was anything alive hiding underneath the rocks at the water's edge when I first saw the man. He seemed ordinary enough to me, just a short, dark-haired man in what looked to me like normal fishing gear. It would be years later before it occurred to me that I'd only ever seen fishermen on television and movies dressed like that, and the clothes he wore were actually decades out of style. As a kid, it made perfect sense to me. He was a fisherman. He was wearing what fishermen wore. The only thing that seemed off to me at the time was that he was standing a few feet behind my dad, but they weren't talking to each other. My dad hadn't even turned around. He'd always been pretty friendly and loved to talk, so it was strange to me that he hadn't at least said hello to this newcomer. I was wondering why he was being so rude suddenly when the man noticed me. Without so much as a word to my father, he quickly walked to the riverbank and waved me over. We were still only a few feet away from my dad then, so I figured I was safe to go see what he wanted. When I reached him, he crouched down to my level, and I found myself looking into the saddest pair of eyes I'd ever seen. This man looked like he was having the absolute worst day of his life. He didn't sound any happier than he looked. You really shouldn't be playing so close to the edge, honey, he said somberly. Those rocks are slippery. You could fall in, and it's awfully hard to swim in a current that strong. You could drown. I remember being a bit put out that a random stranger was telling me what to do, and that he had implied that my doggy paddle wouldn't be enough in the event that I fell into the river. Nevertheless, he was staring at me so intensely that I assured him I would stay away from the rocks and went to pick flowers instead. My dad came to find me a little while later, confused as to why I'd given up jumping around on the rocks. When I explained that the man had told me not to play there, he frowned. What man are you talking about? he asked. The man who was standing behind you, I answered, obviously. Suddenly dad didn't feel like fishing anymore. He abruptly picked up all of our gear and led me back to the car. As he was loading everything into the trunk, he told me we had been the only two people by the river all morning. I tried to argue that there had been another man there, that I had even spoken to him, but he shook his head. It's just been me and you, kiddo. Look, ours is the only car in the parking lot. He was right, of course, and whether he believed what I said or not, he quickly decided we could spend the rest of our morning together at the closest Tim Hortons instead. We never went back to that river. I don't know whether it was because my dad was spooked or because he just didn't catch anything there but all of our subsequent fishing trips involved familiar ponds and little fish. I do know, however, that I never forgot the man by the river, knowing now that children are more likely to experience the supernatural. I wonder if he had drowned in that river, or maybe he lost a loved one to the current, and he was spending his afterlife preventing others from making the same mistake. Regardless, I hope he has moved on by now or at least found some peace. No one ought to be that sad for eternity. The cold had settled deep into my bones by the time we hit the icy patch on Rutherford Lane. I could almost hear the brittle crackle of frost under the tires, an eerie symphony against the distant whisper of winter wind. Lucy, my sister, was humming along to some forgotten Christmas tune playing softly on the radio, her breath fogging up the passenger window as she traced lazy patterns on the glass. I think it's going to snow tonight, she murmured 
more to herself than to me. I just nodded, keeping my eyes fixed on the road ahead. The headlights carved out a tunnel of dim yellow light through the thick darkness, barely illuminating the gnarled branches of the trees lining the narrow lane. That's when the car hit the ice. One moment, everything was as it should be. Quiet. Calm. The steady hum of the engine. And the next, the world spun wildly out of control. The steering wheel jerked in my hands as the back end of the car slid out, and I fought desperately to regain control. But it was too late. The car skidded around the bend, tires losing their grip on the slick surface, and we were tumbling sideways into the ditch. The sound was deafening, metal crunching, glass shattering, our screams lost amidst the chaos. When we finally came to a stop, the car was on its side in a farmer's field. The night eerily silent except for the hiss of the engine cooling and Lucy's ragged breathing. Are you okay? I managed, my voice sounding strangely detached. Lucy nodded, her face pale in the dim light filtering through the cracked windshield. I think so. You? Yeah, I'm fine. But I wasn't really sure. My heart was racing, adrenaline pumping so loudly in my ears it was hard to think. We scrambled out of the car, the cold air hitting us like a wall. The ground was hard and frozen beneath our feet as we surveyed the damage. The front bumper was gone, torn off in our descent, and one of the wheels had sheared away, disappearing into the darkness. I'll call Dan, I said, pulling out my phone with numb fingers. Lucy huddled close, her arms wrapped around herself as she shivered. The call went straight to voicemail. Dan was still at work, probably hadn't even checked his phone. I tried again, the sense of isolation deepening with each unanswered ring. We should find somewhere warm, Lucy suggested after a few minutes, her voice small against the vastness of the night. Just then, headlights pierced the darkness, a car slowing as it approached our wreck. Relief washed over me until I saw the driver. A woman, middle-aged and smiling kindly, rolled down her window. You girls need help? I explained our situation quickly, the words tumbling out in a rush. Drive to the village, she advised. Ask for my husband, Tom. He'll come back with a tow rope. It sounded like a plan, a lifeline, and as she drove off, promising quick help, I felt the weight of the night lighten slightly. But as the minutes stretched into hours with no sign of her or Tom, that fleeting sense of security evaporated like mist in the morning sun, leaving us cold, alone, and beginning to despair. Time seemed to stretch out into eternity as we waited in the frozen field. The occasional hoot of an owl, or the distant rustle of wind through the branches, was the only break in the silence that enveloped us. My phone was rapidly losing battery, and with each passing minute, the likelihood of Tom's arrival seemed to dwindle into nothingness. Lucy paced back and forth, her arms wrapped tightly around herself against the biting cold. What if she forgot about us? She asked, her voice carrying a tremor of real fear. I don't know, I replied, trying to mask my own concern. But we can't stay out here all night. Just then, the beam of headlights cut through the darkness once more, and a truck pulled up alongside our broken car. Two men stepped out, their faces shadowed, and voices carrying thick accents that I couldn't place. Need help? One of them called out, a smile playing on his lips that didn't quite reach his eyes. Something about the situation felt off. I hesitated, taking in their well-equipped truck and the rope already in hand. We're waiting for someone, I said finally, my voice firmer than I felt. They seemed to consider this, exchanging a look that I couldn't read in the dim light. We can't leave you here, the same man insisted, stepping closer. The smell of oil and earth clung to them, a stark reminder of the wilderness that surrounded us. No thank you, I said again, this time more forcefully. They paused, the atmosphere charged with an unspoken tension, before finally getting back into their truck and driving away. Relief washed over me briefly, until I saw their headlights pause and turn back towards us. My heart sank. They returned, parking their truck with the engine still running. It's not safe for you here. Let us help, the man repeated, stepping out again, this time not waiting for an answer. Fear gripped me, icy and sharp as the wind. 
I stood my ground though my body screamed at me to flee. Please just leave us alone, I shouted, my voice echoing in the stillness. It was then, at that moment of peak desperation, that another vehicle approached. A regular sedan, not a truck. A man jumped out, moving with purpose and authority. He didn't speak much, only working quickly to attach a tow rope to our car and affixing a spare tire. As he worked, I asked, did you see anyone else when you pulled up? No, just you girls, he answered without looking up. Confusion and relief swirled through me. This was Tom, the husband of the woman who had stopped earlier. His arrival was so timely it felt almost miraculous, considering the unnerving encounter we had just endured. As he drove us to my boyfriend's workplace, my shoulder began to throb painfully, a delayed reaction to the adrenaline that had fueled me through the night. Tom's wife had sent him immediately, he explained, which puzzled me further about the passage of time that night. The last thing he said stuck with me, chilling in its simplicity. Sometimes help comes from where you least expect it, sometimes not at all. But tonight, it seems you needed a bit of both. It was the kind of August night where the air felt just a little too still and the stars a little too dim. I lay in my hammock, bundled up in my sleeping bag, listening to the soft rustles of the forest around our campsite. My uncle, his friend D, and two other friends were all sleeping in their tents. We were camped about twenty minutes from the trailhead of Half Dome, a giant granite dome in Yosemite National Park that we planned to hike up the next morning. Earlier that evening, we had set up our camp quickly. My uncle, who's 32 and always in charge of these adventures, made sure everyone knew what to do. Dee, who's about the same age as my uncle and just as outdoorsy, helped get the fire going. We roasted some marshmallows and told a few jokes, the kind that made everyone laugh until they forgot about the hike's early start. But here I was, suddenly wide awake at 3.30 a.m., I wasn't sure what had woken me up, but once I was awake, I couldn't go back to sleep. I lay there, looking up at the moon through the trees. It was unusually bright, casting eerie shadows on the ground and making the leaves glisten like silver. It almost felt like I was in a dream, everything bathed in a ghostly white light. Curiosity got the better of me, and I quietly slipped out of my hammock. I didn't want to wake anyone up, so I tiptoed around feeling the cool air against my face. That's when I realized how silent it was. No crickets chirping, no rustles of small animals. It was like the forest was holding its breath. Deciding it was too spooky to stay out alone, I went back to my hammock. Just as I was about to try and sleep again, I heard it. Footsteps. Not the light, scampering ones of a raccoon or a squirrel, but heavy, deliberate human footsteps. I froze listening as they moved around our campsite. My heart raced. We were supposed to be the only ones here. Unable to stay still any longer, I shook my uncle's tent. Uncle Mike, I whispered urgently. He grumbled, annoyed at being woken up, but then I saw his face change as he listened to the footsteps too. He grabbed his flashlight and peeked outside. Stay here, he murmured, zipping up the tent behind him. I waited every sound making me jump. After what felt like hours but was probably only a few minutes, my uncle returned. He looked puzzled. There's no one out there, he said, but his voice was uneasy. Were you walking around just now? I shook my head. No, I woke up because I heard it too. He frowned, thinking it over. Well, let's try to get some sleep. We need to be up soon anyway. But as he settled back into his tent, I knew neither of us would sleep well. Whatever was out there, or maybe wasn't, had already stirred the night air into something strange. And so, with a mixture of fear and excitement, I lay back in my hammock, staring at the moonlit sky, wondering what adventures tomorrow would bring, and hoping the mysteries of tonight were just tricks of the light and shadow. As the clock struck 4.30 a.m., our alarms buzzed loudly in the still, dark morning, Everyone groggily climbed out of their tents and sleeping bags, rubbing sleep from their eyes. The air was cool and crisp, perfect for hiking. 
We quickly munched on some granola bars and strapped on our backpacks, eager to start our adventure up Half Dome. Uncle Mike checked his watch and nodded. All right, let's head to the trailhead. We piled into the car and drove the short distance in near silence, the only sound being the gravel crunching under the tires. When we arrived, it was still dark, the only light coming from our headlamps and the dim glow of dawn on the horizon. D announced he needed to use the restroom before we started hiking. I'll catch up with you guys in a bit, he said, walking towards the bathrooms across the field at the intersection near the trailhead. I started to follow him, thinking I might as well go too, but then I remembered I had left my water bottle in the car. Go ahead, I'll catch up, I called after him. I jogged back to the car, grabbed my water bottle, and then hurried to the trailhead to wait for Uncle Mike and the rest of the group. We all gathered, adjusting our gear, but D was taking longer than expected. He's probably just taking his time, Uncle Mike said, trying to sound unconcerned. But as minutes turned into ten minutes, then fifteen, we all began to look at each other with worried expressions. Maybe I should go check on him, I suggested, feeling a bit nervous. Uncle Mike nodded, and I sprinted back to the bathrooms. I pushed open the door to each stall. No D. He wasn't anywhere around. My heart started to beat faster. Where could he have gone? I ran back to the group out of breath. He's not there, I exclaimed. Uncle Mike's brow furrowed with worry. That's odd. Maybe he went back to the car. We decided to split up. I would stay at the trailhead in case D showed up, and Uncle Mike would go back to the car. As I waited alone, the sky began to brighten, but my worry darkened. Every minute felt like an hour. I paced back and forth, peering into the dim light, hoping to see Dee walking towards me. Finally, Uncle Mike returned, shaking his head. He's not at the car either. Just then, as panic was about to set in, I saw a figure approaching from the direction of the car. It was Dee, looking disheveled with sweat on his forehead and a strange look in his eyes. Relief washed over me, but it was quickly replaced by confusion at his appearance. Where have you been? I asked, my voice a mix of relief and frustration. I just went to the bathroom and when I came out nobody was here, Dee replied, sounding confused. But we've been here waiting for you this whole time. We even checked the bathroom, I said, puzzled. Dee just shook his head looking as baffled as I felt. I don't know. I went to the bathroom. Where's Mike? He asked repeating the question even after I answered. Something was off. His repeated questions and disoriented look made me uneasy. As we walked back to join the others, I couldn't shake the feeling that something strange was going on. What exactly happened to Dee while he was gone? And why did he seem so different now? With Dee finally back, though seeming a bit off, we all started our hike up the steep trails of Half Dome. The early morning light filtered through the trees, casting long shadows on the path. Everyone was quiet, maybe thinking about Dee's weird disappearance and sudden return, or maybe just focusing on the challenging climb ahead. As we hiked, the weirdness of the morning seemed to follow us. It started with small things. First, Uncle Mike couldn't find his small red flashlight in his backpack. I swear I packed it right on top, he muttered, searching through his bag. We all waited as he checked again, but it was nowhere to be found. Then, one of the girls noticed she was missing a glove. We all stopped and helped her look around the trail where we had just walked, but there was no sign of it. I just had it a minute ago, she said, sounding confused and a bit frustrated. Next, my water bottle, which I had clipped to my belt, was gone. I felt the clip. It was still closed, which made no sense. How could my water bottle just vanish? We must be more tired than we thought, Uncle Mike tried to joke but his smile didn't reach his eyes. The mood had shifted, and a faint, unsettling feeling hung in the air. As we pushed deeper into our hike, the forest seemed to close in around us. The trees looked taller, darker, and the path less familiar. Uncle Mike, who had hiked this trail many times before, suddenly stopped. Doesn't it seem like we should have reached the halfway point by now? He asked, looking back at us. Yeah, it feels like we've been walking for hours. I agreed, my voice a little shaky. The path seemed to stretch on endlessly. Every turn looked the same. Every tree seemed to repeat. Were we walking in circles? The atmosphere felt heavier. 
almost as if the air was thicker. It was hard to shake the feeling that something was watching us, something not quite friendly. It feels like the woods are alive, I whispered to no one in particular. We kept walking, but progress felt slow, almost dreamlike. Time stretched and bent. Uncle Mike stopped several more times, scratching his head and looking around. This is ridiculous, he laughed nervously. It's like we're stuck in some sort of loop. Eventually, after what seemed like an eternity, the trail began to look familiar again. Landmarks that should have passed hours ago suddenly appeared. Relief washed over us, but it was mixed with confusion and a touch of fear. How had we gotten so lost on a well-marked trail? When we finally saw the parking lot through the trees, it felt like we had emerged from another world. The car was just as we left it, quiet and unassuming, yet it felt like a lifeline back to reality. As we drove back to camp, nobody talked much. Each of us was lost in thought, trying to make sense of the day's mysterious events. It wasn't just the physical items we had lost on the trail. It felt like we had lost a piece of our normal reality out there. That night, as I lay in my hammock looking up at the stars, the forest didn't seem so friendly anymore. I wondered if we'd ever really understand what happened on the trail that day, or if some mysteries were meant to stay hidden in the shadows of Half Dome.